The most remarkable fact about the decline of men in America is how relentlessly our leaders pretend it's not happening at all. The patriarchy is thriving, they tell us. Men are in charge, and they succeed precisely to the extent they thwart the progress of women. Society is a zero-sum equation in which a man's gain is a woman's loss. This is wrong, and we must rectify it. That's the message. Those also happen to be the core assumptions of second wave feminism, which became popular 40 years ago, just as many of our baby boom leaders were coming of age. And yet none of those assumptions are true today. America has changed completely. The patriarchy is gone. Women are winning. Men are failing. Men in America are now far more likely to die of a drug overdose, drop out of the workforce because of an addiction, commit a felony, and go to prison. They fail in school much more often than women do. They kill themselves at many times the rate. Overall, they die years younger. Those numbers are not speculative. They are hard data gathered over decades by nonpartisan researchers. You'd have to ignore a huge amount of settled science in order to repeat the pieties of 1970s era feminism. And yet that is exactly what our leaders continue to do. In March of 2009, almost immediately after arriving in Washington, Barack Obama created the White House Council on Women and Girls. He tapped his advisor, Valerie Jarrett, to run it. Quote, when our daughters don't have the same education and career opportunities as our sons, Obama said in his announcement, that affects our economy and our future as a nation. At the very moment Obama was lamenting the lack of educational opportunities for women, more girls than boys were graduating from high school. Far more were graduating from college. Women now earn 62% of associate's degrees, 57% of bachelor's degrees, 60% of master's degrees, and 52% of doctorates. That gap is even wider in non-white neighborhoods. For example, in 2007, among black and Hispanic graduates of public schools in Boston, for every 100 black men who got a college degree, there were 230 black women who got one. For every 100 Hispanic men who got a college degree, there were 211 Hispanic women who got one. 70% of all master's degrees awarded to black students nationally went to black women. Just 30% went to black men. Yet for reasons the Obama administration never explained, the school performance of black and Hispanic girls was deemed a higher priority than the performance of black and Hispanic boys. Under Obama, the White House solicited hundreds of millions of dollars from corporations to encourage female achievement in higher education. At the time this was happening, one study showed that there were already at least four times as many privately funded college scholarships available for girls as for boys, four times. The administration never acknowledged this. Instead, it sought new ways to close a gender gap that no longer exists. One idea was, quote, breaking down gender stereotypes in toys. To that end, the White House pressured manufacturers, retailers, and media outlets to eliminate gender distinction in children's toys. This, the administration claimed, would allow kids to, quote, explore, learn, and dream without limits. Well, educators at all levels took this idea seriously. In 2015, one kindergarten teacher in Washington State banned her male students from playing with Lego. Fitting together plastic blocks has been found by researchers to help children develop important cognitive skills. Boys have enough advantages, the teacher explained, so she intentionally prevented them from learning. Girls thrive when boys fail. This is the underlying assumption of much of America's gender policy in education. There is no credible research to suggest that is true. It is purely an ideological belief. And yet that assumption is pervasive, especially on college campuses. Now that's ironic because there are more than two million more women than men enrolled in college this year. On most campuses, men are a distinct minority. At Carlo University in Pittsburgh, women outnumber men by more than six to one. And yet almost every campus has a women's studies department. In many of them, the stated goal is to fight expressions of masculinity and disempower men. At Ohio State, a course is underway this spring called Be a Man, Masculinities, Race, and Nation. The syllabus for that course explains that masculinity is used to, quote, justify certain kinds of violence by men. On the first day of class, students were required to consult a male privilege checklist. At Duke University in North Carolina, a nine-week workshop met to devise ways to undermine, quote, masculinity and maleness, as well as to create destabilized spaces for those with privilege, meaning men. Similar projects have sprouted at colleges all over the country. Under the Obama administration, the Department of Justice created something called the Healthy Masculinity Campus Athletics Project. 
The coordinator of that program at Wheaton College summed up its objective this way, quote, as a country, we need to do a better job of addressing issues around toxic masculinity. Left unasked was the most basic question of all. Is masculinity itself really toxic? And what happens to boys when we tell them that it is? It's widely understood that attacking people for their basic nature is unhealthy and it's wrong. A government-funded program designed to fight toxic femininity or toxic homosexuality probably would not escape the scrutiny of Congress or the media. At the very least, its supporters would have to explain why our country needs a program like that. And yet nobody has been forced to explain why boys who are already failing need to be held back further. And so they are. Christina Hoff Summers is the author of The War Against Boys. She was one of the very first people in American intellectual life to notice this trend and to sound the alarm. She was ignored, but we're grateful that she did it anyway. Thank you. Christina Hoff Summers joins us tonight. So you, you wrote this original piece from which this whole series basically has been derived almost 20 years ago when you noticed that boys were falling behind. And yet the assumptions of the people who make policy decisions don't seem to have changed much in that time. Why? There's a great deal of resistance to addressing the needs of boys. And, and there are a lot of women's groups, uh, not all of them, but most of them call it backlash. And they're unwilling to listen. So boys, we, we, it's as if we've, we've thrown the gender switch and boys are on the wrong side of the gender gap but in education. How does the, so the, the core assumption is that it's a zero-sum arrangement where when you hold back boys, girls shoot ahead and it's great for them. But that's not really the nature of life, is it? Does it help girls that when boys is fail? a fundamental fallacy. See, there, I think too many of the activist groups think that there's a trophy, and either Venus is going to win or Mars, and their job is to root for Venus and make sure you know, hold back Mars. No, there's not a single trophy. Men and women, boys and girls, we're in this together. Yeah. And if boys are in trouble, so are we all. I mean, these are the young men with whom our daughters and granddaughters are going to f make the future. And so if boys are failing, what's going to happen to girls? That's a, great, that's a question that a father of every daughter, including myself, thinks about uh, a lot. So I, you sort of wonder, like, how do we get to a place where colleges, in which, broadly speaking, men really are failing, falling behind girls, have funded departments whose main course of study is why masculinity, maleness, is bad? <laughs> why doesn't anybody ever say anything about that? We try, but again, you're, you're, you're called names and demonized if you, if you defend boys and point out their plight, specifically in education. And we have economists now, Larry Summers, for example, projects that by mid-century, it may be a third of, the, of men in the full-time workforce uh, are going to be out of the workforce, uh, disengaged, not there. Millions of men are simply not going to be looking for work, not, not in, in the workplace. Now, we can address this. England, Australia, Canada, they're very worried about because of the future of their economy and because of the social, you know, just confusion that this will lead to. Uh, and they're addressing the problem. They haven't solved it, but they're working on it. We haven't really acknowledged it. What does it say about our policymakers that they're acting from assumptions that were relevant in 1979 but are no longer? Well, they're, they're not paying attention. And I think it's, it's, not, it's hard to know where to place the fault because there's simply what we have right now is vast numbers of organizations that have actually done a very good job supporting young women and helping yes. young women, addressing their needs. Girls were behind in math and science. And thanks to many women's groups and activists, we have strengthened young women. They take more advanced math classes and science classes than boys now in school. Where were the efforts for boys? There, weren't the, there was no lobby. There's no lobby. And people say, well, they don't need a lobby. It's a man's world. Well, I'm not sure that's true but it, altogether, but it's certainly not a little boy's world. And no one's paying attention. Sad. Well, thank Well, they're invisible in Washington, uncounted by the official unemployment numbers you hear on television. And yet they're everywhere. Americans who have dropped out of the workforce, workers who don't work. An ever-increasing percentage of these are male. About 7 million American men between the ages of 25 and 54 no longer have jobs. That's more than 10% of the entire prime age male labor force in the United States. It's a huge number. Most of those men, studies predict, will never return to work. What happened? 
Well, some of the causes are well known. Competition from foreign manufacturers crushed our country's industrial sector. China's entry into the WTO alone destroyed more than 2 million American jobs. Automation is killing many more. A disproportionate number of these jobs are in traditionally male industries, manufacturing, agriculture, logging. A 2016 McKinsey report found that, quote, 90% of what welders, cutters, solderers, and brazers do could be replaced by robots, and soon. Jobs in which women are the majority tend to be far less vulnerable to automation. Three of the five fastest growing professions are dominated by women. The jobs that remain for men tend to pay less than the ones that disappeared. This is especially true for working class men who, unlike their female counterparts, have seen, seen their real wages fall over time. Now, part of the reason for that is mass immigration. More than a million new immigrants enter this country every year legally. A large but unknown number come illegally. Most of these are low skilled. All of them are looking for work. These new rivals compete primarily with the very Americans most likely to have lost their jobs. And the effect is lower wages. It's a matter of supply and demand. An overabundance of anything makes it cheaper, and that goes for labor. One study conducted after the Mariel boat lift in Florida found that Americans with lower education levels in Miami, the most vulnerable, saw their wages fall by 37% after the immigrants arrived. Policymakers didn't seem to notice, and they still don't, probably because it doesn't affect them. If waves of immigrants from the third world are becoming lawyers and nonprofit executives and members of Congress, how long would the borders stay open? Meanwhile, millions of American men now make less than their fathers did. That's a tragedy. It's a betrayal of the American dream. But it's also a recipe for societal collapse. When men's wages decline, families fall apart. This fact is well known to researchers. It's been the subject of many studies over decades with consistent results. And yet it's rarely noted in public. Here's some of what we know. One well-regarded study released last year found that when men's wages fell relative to women's, families didn't form. According to the authors, a falling male wage reduced, quote, the attractiveness of men as potential spouses, thus reducing fertility and especially marriage rates. Researchers also noted a dramatic increase in out-of-wedlock births when men made less. In the words of one of the authors, an economics professor at MIT, quote, we see a decline in fertility, a decline in marriage, but a rise in the fraction of births that are disadvantaged. As a consequence, the kids are living in pretty tough circumstances. Numerous academic studies have reached the very same conclusion. Research from 2015 found that, quote, when a randomly chosen woman becomes more likely to earn more than a randomly chosen man, marriage rates decline. Those who do marry report being less satisfied and are more likely to divorce. Low male wages are a driving force in family dissolution, and that's why affluent neighborhoods in which men make more have a higher proportion of married couples and fewer divorces. The opposite is also true, and that leads to a cascade of social problems, which over time become a disaster. Men who make lower wages marry less and father more children out of wedlock. These children growing up without fathers tend to make lower wages themselves in later life. For decades, this was a universally recognized pattern in inner cities, the cycle of poverty. Much was written about it. Now the same destructive vortex is common in rural America. The cause isn't culture, that's what we thought, no. In both cases, the cause is the same, a lack of well-paying jobs for men. What's striking is how little notice these facts get from our policymakers. Their overriding aim is to raise women's wages to parity or above men's. There's nothing inherently wrong with that, but these are complex questions with numerous and profound unintended consequences. So they deserve a vigorous public debate. It's notable that most women, the very population on whose behalf these policies are supposedly devised, strongly prefer to marry men who make more than they do. But what's beyond debate is that Washington and corporate America aren't thinking a lot about how to solve the male wage crisis. If anything, they're exacerbating it. Lawmakers in both parties, for example, have heartily embraced self-driving vehicles and drone delivery of packages. It's all impressive technology, but what would be the effect on employment? Has anyone asked that? There are more than three million professional truck drivers in this country. It is the most common job in the majority of American states. More than 90% of drivers are men. Thanks to technology, 
Many of these men are about to lose their jobs. That's a lot of unemployed Americans. That's a lot of broken families. Washington is not worried at all about this. Lawmakers and business leaders assure us that those truck drivers will be just fine. They'll find something else to do, something better, in fact, with higher pay. And maybe they will.